take a look at that sh- that stock though. And it had been up when Sarah was doing it at the top of the show, 110 percent. Yeah, the meme trade may very well be back. Roaring Kitty, remember that name of Wall Street Bets fame? He's returned and shares of GameStop are up as a result. Stock's been halted seven times since trading got underway. Just That's just in 45 minutes. So uh, I don't even know if it's halted again. Let's get over to Kate Rooney. Just tell us what, what you're hearing and what's going on here. Kate. Hey, David. Yeah, so this is Keith Gill's first online post we've seen in three years. Roaring Kitty, as he's also known, was, if you remember, really the Pied Piper of the meme stock frenzy in 2021. He led those online traders to the infamous GameStop short squeeze this morning, posting kind of cryptic photo of somebody just leaning forward, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) in a chair. And that was enough to send GameStop up. As you said, more than 100 percent. It has been halted for volatility. Our Robert Hum just sent out a note explaining this. He said trading activity for GME has been only 10 minutes. The rest of the day has been halted. And even with just 10 minutes of trading, the stock did three and a half times the normal volume. But it's not just GME, guys. Other so-called meme stocks like AMC are also catching a bit. It is one sign of overall risk appetite increasing. You'll also see that showing up in the options market, especially for the most volatile corner of that ultra short maturities, once really reserved for professional traders. Zero days to expire options have climbed in popularity among everyday investors. These are one day bets on the direction of the market, which can offer outsized returns, rewards and also outsized risk. Last week, retail activity and zero DTE options, as they're known, saw the biggest Weekly sales since the beginning of the year, that's according to J.P. Morgan, they are making up a larger slice of overall options trades out there. And meanwhile, there has been less buying of some of the safer proxies for cash. Vander Research points out slowing flows into money market funds after the surge of inflows as rates started to rise. Vanda says all of this new risk appetite is a function of chasing rising risk asset prices. And then tax implications. They say tax-related peak retail bearishness is now in the rearview mirror. You note that retail has been rotating more aggressively into single stocks. Guys, back over to you. So, uh, Kate, um, on GameStop, I mean, and I'm not saying this in any way has occurred, but Keith Gill, uh, a.k.a. Roaring Kitty, he could have gone into the options market, bought, bought short term dated options that you're referring to and then put out his tweet with the with the chair. And then, I mean, enormous gains. Right. Uh, you know, you could have bought the 30s, I guess. I can't imagine those costs yeah, very much would, a day or two ago. I was going to say, very well could have. And you're also seeing just more options activity in general. I mean, I mentioned zero DTE. Jay Clayton at a conference last week called that gambling, called out some of these really risky pockets of the market. And, you know, this is in no way indicative of the average retail trader. But you are seeing this prevailing corner of the market that's still willing to bet on a stock like GameStop, which really there's no fundamental reason why the stock is moving. It is seen as essentially a gamble here. Uh, Definitely some flashbacks going on today, Kate. Thank you. You wrote about the increased activity long before. And in fact, if you take a look at GameStop's chart, its stock rally started probably three weeks ago or so. And that's when you started seeing the unusual activity. That's correct. It's it's difficult to call anything unusual in GameStop options. However, going back about two to three weeks, there was a large amount of very far out of the money call options bought. This started in April 26th into the first week of May. And the strike was centered around the 30 strike. About 70,000 of the May 30 calls traded over the last two to three weeks. And it seemed to really set the groundwork for this move when the time seemed to line up. Hey, David, you talk to a lot of very smart institutional investors. You trade with them um, and they look at situations like this because, again, they are unusual. When I look out a month, I look at June expiration. I look at the at the money straddle. That's basically pricing what the expected move is in this stock. It's basically nineteen dollars. It's 60 percent of the price. What are institutions saying to you when they see this sort of activity, especially given what we know about, you know, 2021? It was a fairly short lived phenomenon. So there's two sides of this. I'm seeing both sides of it. On one hand, traders that think that the stock is detaching from its fundamental value have limits in how they can bet against the stock reverting back lower based on it being too dangerous to sell this uh, this stock short. So there there was a huge, uh, uh, there was a large amount of puts traded today, 11 times the normal daily volume traded in puts. So there are people buying puts thinking the stock's going to go lower. However, some of the institution accounts that I speak to 
remember in January 2021, the move had more legs than I think a lot of people realized. That once this move happened, thinking about the supply and demand of who's buying the stock, who's selling the stock, it was it didn't revert lower immediately. It, it kept a floor to it. So I did see some players looking to play the stock saying some more range bound, because as you pointed out, the options are extremely expensive right now. When you take a look at the activity, David, and the activity that we've seen over the past few weeks, is it your view that these are mostly retail traders or were they trades in size, which would indicate institutions? I think I think both, but I think institutions were definitely involved, given the size of what's traded. About two billion of options notional traded today, five billion of stock notional traded, which is large for how GameStop has been trading. But this is still about one tenth of the size that we saw trade in January of 2021. So the size is bigger than just retail playing, but I think institutions have literally seen this movie before and are getting involved in the action as well. David, it's Karen. Thanks for being on. Just looking at the uh, the May 30s that you talked about. So those were 43 cents yesterday and they went out at six and a half or so. So, you know, 15 times your money overnight. Were you able, are you able to see if that's closing, if those are sales to close or what what was the activity in there today? It was a lot of obviously a lot of volume, a, a lot of volume. We won't know if the net impact was opening or closing until tomorrow when the open interest data comes out. However, looking at this, at the volume in the, in the May 30s over the last two weeks, the open interest grew, I believe, every day. So it seemed like continual buying of the May 30 line. Today, the most active line was the May 34 calls. So as the stock went higher, perhaps some of those holders of the, long, of the May 30 calls were moving higher to the May 34 strike as well. When I see meme stock mania taking over again, led by GameStop and AMC, I need to remind you that this is irrational. There's no way these stocks should reach such elevated levels on their own. At one point today, GameStop had a market capitalization of nearly $20 billion, but it finished lower, just under $15 billion. But people were buying or selling millions of shares at those exalted levels. Was GameStop worth almost $20 billion? At the end of the day, it's worth what buyers will pay for it. I accept that. However, I prefer to be a little more rigorous than that because I want something with staying power. The best way to figure out what a company might be worth is to compare it to another company in the same industry. For GameStop, I think the closest compare is Best Buy, another electronics chain with lots of gaming exposure, and one that has a $16 billion market capitalization at the moment, not that much higher than GameStop had for today's ridiculous run. How do they stack up? Let's use the last four years. In the last few, that period's a very good game. GameStop revenues have bounced between $5 and $6 billion. Best Buy, meanwhile, did $43.5 billion in sales this year, almost an order of magnitude higher. How about earnings? After losing mountains of money from 2020 through 2022, GameStop made about $17 million last year. That's an M. By contrast, even though Best Buy's earnings have been on the decline, it still made $1.4 billion last year. Billion with B. You could argue that GameStop's on the upswing while Best Buy's seen its profit go lower. But if they have roughly the same market capitalization, an electronics retailer that's making $1.4 billion should be worth a lot more than a game retailer that's making $17 million, don't you think? Hey, don't forget that Best Buy pays a generous dividend with a 5% yield at these levels while GameStop pays no dividend. Altogether, I just see two, I don't see how these two companies that do roughly the same thing can be worth roughly the same price. According to Wall Street, Best Buy's numbers are so much higher. I'd love to tell you it's radically undervalued because we own this one for the Chapel Trust. But at best, I can just say Best Buy is too cheap. Well, how about the possibility that GameStop can't be judged by its current state? Instead, we need to think about how the company can reinvent itself by selling stock here. Well, let's say they can sell a billion dollars worth of stock, something I think the SEC would actually probably let happen because they don't seem to care either way. If GameStop had an extra billion dollars, it could get out of some bad leases, maybe makes a little more money. Maybe you can use the stock to make an acquisition. Hey, maybe, hey, have them go buy Best Buy, for heaven's sake. GameStop's market capitalization was well above it at one time. But I don't think any potential takeover candidate would be willing to accept a stock deal if GameStop's at these levels. Even if they did, it would crush the stock. And the short sellers who currently are being crushed would make out like bandits. Those who own it would have egg all over their faces as the stock would be obliterated if GameStop did a gigantic offering to pay for a transformational acquisition because that's what it needs as the current business is dying. So the most obvious comparison says GameStop's overvalued. The company's been reluctant to change the stripes, and it can't use its stock to buy someone else without ruining the short buster thesis that got it here. I just can't get 64, or I can't even get the 44 for that matter. 
In short, when I see this running GameStop, the responsible move is simply to say, sell, sell, sell. What about AMC? Different situation entirely. GameStop at least has a good balance sheet and actually turned a profit last year. It's just that the stock's overvalued compared to its peers. But AMC, well, it's left to its own devices. I think this movie theater chain will mostly run out of money in 2026 when $2.8 billion in debt comes due. They sold some stock yesterday from a plan that allows them to raise capital, but the $250 million they raised just made it easier for them to pay their debts to come due in 2025. If the stock keeps climbing, AMC can sell more stock. That's good. Uh, it's, it's how these guys made it through the pandemic to begin with. But that big slug of 2026, it's just way too daunting. In the end, I think it's a dead man walking. You're catching AMC in the walking phase. Sell it before the dead man phase, and you'll do just fine. Power, but first up on last call, what else? The tweet that sparked another meme stock craze. After three years of effectively no online activity that we could tell of, Keith Gill, the man who calls himself Roaring Kitty, published this image on X. Now, it appears to show what is a gamer or a man or something leaning forward, sitting back, and then leaning forward in his chair. The idea being that this person is re-engaging, maybe back in the game. And that tweet and that image was seen more than 20 million times. And since then, Gill has been on fire on X, posting a bunch of movie clips from flicks like Pirates of the Caribbean, The Avengers, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and more. By the way, if you know what any of these clips reference or mean, please let us know, because we have no idea. And when the kitty roared, meme stocks soared. Look at these moves today. This is today. GameStop up 74%. AMC, 78%. With 300 million shares traded. And according to the Cobasi letter, that is about 18 times AMC's average daily volume. Other so called meme stocks also joining the party shares of Vietnamese automaker VinFast, Spirit Airlines, Rivian, Reddit, and more all up big today. And the stonks madness does not end there. GameStop and AMC continue to rise right now. GameStop up 10%, AMC up 17.7% right now. So clearly the return of the meme stock craze has made some traders a lot of money. But could the intense speculation in the market also lead to a sell-off? Remember, back in 2021, the S&P 500 was trading at or near all-time highs when GameStop went to the moon. But instead of selling off, stocks continue to rally the rest of the year. So will history repeat itself? Could the meme stock craze be a good sign for the overall market. Let's talk about it now with our leadoff panel tonight. Joining us is the man they call the godfather of retail options trading. That is Tom Sosnoff, founder and CEO of brokerage firm Tasty Trade, and Wall Street Journal lead writer and CBC contributor Gunjan Banerjee. She knows a thing or two about this roaring kitty fellow because three years ago, she literally wrote the exclusive profile on Keith Gill. So Gunjan, I am gonna start with you why do you think that Gill is back? Do you, I mean, you, you know him a little bit. What's going on here? It's so fascinating, Brian. I mean, this is a man who practically went into hiding after he spoke with the Wall Street Journal around three years ago, did not give another interview, stopped posting, posting on social media. The last we heard of him was after those congressional hearings. But, you know, his tweets today completely brought us back to 2021 when he was actively posting on Reddit about those call options that he bought, and it triggered this massive squeeze in GameStop shares. And, you know, it was lighting up social media, lighting up brokerage platforms all of today. Maybe like Tasty Trade, Tom. I mean, <laughs> get, we're going to do something later on the show about how much money the short sellers lost today in GameStop, AMC, and others. Were these orderly markets, though? I mean, are, are these just all retail investors from your perch that are doing this? I can't imagine retail investors could drive a stock up 74 percent. Are hedge funds also getting involved, you think? Well, it's funny. It's funny, Brian. I remember, I think, three years ago talking to Gunjan just about this topic, about whether it was retail or whether it was, um, and I think we talked for a long time and discussed it. Um, I mean, obviously, a good portion of the stock speculation side um, was probably a combination of retail investors and also high frequency firms and prop firms trying to get in front of um, in front of the order flow. You know, it's it's one thing if you're going to make markets and you're going to and you think there's the risk of what happened in 2021 to all happen, to happen all over again. I think one of the things that you want to do as a 
a market making firm is to buy a bunch of stock just so you have you have the ability to sell options and everything else that that retail investors are going to come after. So I think that was part of the speculation today. I also think that there's a huge attraction to noise because it's been so so dead lately and so dull the last couple of weeks that I think, you know, this just fired everybody up. So I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it was actually a fun day today. Yeah, it, it was a fun day today. And obviously, I mean, it drove traffic to CNBC.com. People are watching and listening to us, hopefully. <laughs> Gunjan, speaking of speculation, I'm going to ask you to wildly speculate because you don't we don't know. But do you have any ideas to why now? Why? Why would Keith Gill, Roaring Kitty, decide that today, like a random to Tom's point, a random day in May was the day to pop back up? You know, it's interesting. We have seen these pockets of intense speculation. The meme stocks come roaring back from time to time. And I think they've become part of how our modern market functions. You know, we saw the Donald Trump stock get meme stockified, um, making up a word there. We saw this happen with the Silicon Valley bank crisis. It, it's happened from time to time. I will say that it doesn't mean that happy days are necessarily here for individual investors, because I think there's a really ugly underbelly that's formed to the meme stock madness. And many individual investors I've interviewed didn't make money on meme stocks. In fact, they lost money. And I think seeing that eye popping 40, 50 percent gain can be quite misleading sometimes. Yeah. I mean, Tom, well, let's talk about options because a lot of options activity in GameStop and traders, according to Bloomberg, were picking up GameStop options ahead of roaring Kitty's tweet. I think just could be all luck. Could also be very convenient. Could also be something else. I mean, did you see any unusual activity or anything to kind of maybe make the radar go off to you? There was a little pickup in option activity last week, towards the end of last week. But I have to be to be fair, the markets in GameStop options um, aren't that good. So, I mean, most of the activity, and a lot of it was in AMC as well today. AMC had a huge option volume. But you have to re realize, when stocks have front month volatility of over 200 or 300% like GameStop and AMC did today, that means there's, if you're thinking pot odds alone, that means there's a chance they could go up double and only go down one. So you're risking one to make two in the eyes of you know the volatility watchers. And I think that creates a lot of the excitement I think that's more so. I, I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anything unethical going on. I think it was just, you know what? It was crazy coincidental. And um, I don't know why he did what he did today, but that's, you know, that's that's part of the whole game we play. It was. I mean, literally like a picture of a guy moving forward in a chair. And, and this is what happens. I mean, I'm I've seen some weird things in my time, Tom. So have you. This might be right up there quickly. Gungeon, don't give it too much away. What is your headline? in the journal tomorrow. What's the takeaway from this? My takeaway is that minting money, trading meme stocks isn't as easy as it looks. It was really fun to follow along with the memes. I think people get really excited on social media at the brokerage firms when they see this deluge of activity. But I think a lot of investors end up getting in at the wrong time, unfortunately. All right, we'll wait for that article. Tom Sosniff, Gunjan Banerjee, great. What a day. You know, this is what happens. I go out west, I come back, meme stocks go crazy. I think I need to go back to L.A. Tom and Gungeon, thank you very much. Is it surprising at all that we are seeing the return of the meme stock craze? Uh, a bit, a bit. Good morning, Dom. How are you? Um, you know, it is. I, you know, I think just, just to start, I, you know, I think the market's a touch quiet right now. I think we're sort of going through this transitional period. Um, you know, you know I, I hate to say maybe... Maybe some college kids are kind of winding down in class. Um, you, you don't know. I don't think it's a return. It's a much different market dynamic with the stock itself. It's a different, you know, it's a different economy where we are. In Roaring Kid, he put up a couple pictures of a guy engaged. I mean, what's he looking at? You know, four decade high inflation. Maybe Nasdaq breaking a new highs. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. What were the lessons that we learned in the wake of the meme stock frenzy back in 2020 and 2021? It was the pandemic. Stimulus checks were abounding. People were opening up yeah. Robin Hood accounts and other brokerage accounts like crazy. People were surging in options trading. All of this stuff was part of the backdrop for the original meme stock craze. We're not there, you say. But what have we learned about that that makes this time different? 
Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it, uh, great question, Dom. I mean, to, first, the logistics, the way the stock is trading. Back in 2020, I mean, there was more open short interest than float on the stock. And I think most of us, professionals included, didn't even know that was possible, right? So there was the, flo- the short interest was $250 million back then, and there was 275% of that float. Today, the short interest is about $65 million, and only 30% of that float is short, which means the fire for you know a short covering rally, I don't think is there. You know the lessons we learned. I was on a show on CNBC when the current CEO of GameStop, uh, Ryan Cohen, took a position in Bed Bath and Beyond. He got and he got he got aggressive with it. Um, I warned on air. I said, please don't get involved. There's so many other good quality companies making good profits, changing, innovating to be in- invested in. Don't touch it. And Dom, um, I got skewered on the Reddit boards. I mean, horrible written things. I thought about. I'm still thinking about years later. You know, I tried to respond, and they don't let you respond unless you post often on there. So, you know, we have a similar situation here. The company is. You know, they're supposed to make 12 cents last year. They made about six cents. The, the, the outlook is negative. Um, I think it's a different economy. People are working. Um, you know, there's not as much liquidity out there. It's a little bit of a transitional period in the market right now. So please focus on better ideas. Um, I will probably try to short the stock via options if the brokers allow it. Tried to do it last time. It, it wasn't, the trade wasn't taken. So I would just caution. There's too many opportunities out, right, out there right now to get involved in this. Okay, Todd, before we we let you go. I, I mentioned and I asked about the lessons learned here. We, we're also seeing yeah. this. You can't blame folks, including myself, for being drawn to charts and quotes that show massive upside volatility because it makes people feel like, hey, people are getting rich really quick. What would you what would be your advice to those people who want to go out there right now and traffic trade, uh, whether it would be outright with stocks or the options in names like GameStop, AMC, Cost, BlackBerry, and others. You know, I, I think I'm speaking more to the younger crowd, and also the you know, the C, the CNBC viewerships, perhaps children. You know, there's so many companies out there. We're going through an amazing generative AI next generation tech, technological boom. Companies are massive. Companies are beating EPS by 50. percent Don't try to buy the cheap, weak stocks that you know a message board. And I have a ton of respect for Reddit. I know I'm setting myself up for pain here. Are going after. You know, there's better ways. There's more disciplined ways to make good money if you can effectively deploy your capital. I mean, there's just too much going on in this market right now to buy companies that are losing money and are, are firing employees and closing stores. Really encouraged to, to get everyone involved, you know, the kids and, and people who are involved in this to, to you know, be, there's better companies out there to trade. Welcome back, everybody. Games, uh, GameStop shares are soaring once again this morning, adding more than 170 uh, percent just since yesterday morning. Another meme stock soaring along with GameStop is AMC. AMC is up 187 percent for the week to date. And of course, it's only Tuesday. Joining us right now with more on this is Jay Clayton. He is former SEC chair and a CNBC contributor. And Jay, we've been kicking this around this morning. I got a whole lot of different takes on this. First of all, the short sellers didn't learn their lesson last time around. Second of all, retail investors are back with a vengeance. But you can't really call this investing either. Um, These are massive swings. As a former SEC chair, what do you think when you look at all of this? Well, it it bothers me. It bothers me on on many levels. I, I think your last guess got it right. It, it's, it's a lot closer to gambling than it is to trading, and it's certainly not investing. And, you know, is a, is a tweet really investment advice? I think we've learned over the last five, six, seven years that a tweet is really never this investment is a tweet advice. This never even mentions that the companies involved. I mean, that's what's so phenomenal, to see massive moves like this when really it was just the implication that he may be setting up and taking notice. That's the tweet we're talking about. Yeah, and, and we, can, we can debate whether that's, you know, uh, let, let's put it this way, whether it's legal or illegal or it's manipulation or not. But I have a question for Keith Gill, which is why not tell people why you did it? Why not come on the show and say, are you saying that, that, that GameStop is now a good investment opportunity? Um, you know, we don't know. What we know is that it triggered uh, what I would say is euphoric and speculative buying uh, among the retail community, which is never a great thing.
So it, this was a really interesting proposition put up by Matt Levine from Bloomberg yesterday. Mm -hmm. Just what about the idea if Keith Gill, Roaring Kitty, who tweeted this, were to have gone on and bought options ahead of time, tweeted this, and then made a lot of money based on everybody going into this and the price going up, is that illegal? It's not insider trading. It's not insider trading. That's, that's, that's clear. Unless he, and he's trading on his own information. That's why it's not in, insider trading. But is this, is this something that we should be tolerating in our markets? You know, whether it's legal or illegal, I don't think so. And that's why I say, why doesn't he, you know. But okay, what does that mean very, not to tolerate? Was, so the idea, I would think, is you look at this more in the context of market manipulation, mm -hmm. right? And the question is, are you allowed to manipulate the market? People, by the way, publish things all the time and they say, hey, I like this stock. And they, you know, hope that other folks follow them. Is that market manipulation? Gen generally not. Maybe, generally maybe, maybe not. not. So what is the distinction in your mind as somebody who ran this department and who's looking at and cares about the integrity of these markets? Well, uh, that's why that's why I'm saying, OK, we can we can discuss what are exactly the facts and circumstances around the publication right. of this tweet and the like. But in but in the meantime, if you care about the markets and you care about investing, come on this program. Right. Tell people tell people why you did this. From What's your up? lips. God bless you. We hope he does. Okay. But again, is there is there anything illegal about this or not? You may not like the way it looks. There, there, there is nothing illegal about saying, I like a stock. There are things illegal about saying, you know, I, I like a stock and taking activity in the marketplace that's designed to, you know, drive behavior indicate that prices are rising and like those types of things pumps are illegal. Pumps and dumps aren't illegal necessarily. Pumps and dumps, but they can be and they cannot be. It depends on how you're doing them. Which is why, which is why a retrospective enforcement action is something we always need to do when there is illegal behavior. But we also need to call it out and say, hey, what's really happening here? Why is this going on? And that's that I think and, is, and is particularly important. And what's your concern? I mean, if, when you look at this, you worry about the retail investor who follows in. You worry about the short yeah, sellers well, who get squashed. Well, let's, let's take a step back. We're, we're doing a bad job for our retail investors. We're doing a really bad job because you have two choices. You can invest in an S&P 500 index-like product where 30 percent of your returns are driven by six stocks. And any kind of stock picking in, in that really doesn't matter as you go down the spectrum of public companies. Mm -hmm. We're also not bringing enough companies into the public market. So you have that choice, which is kind of a I'm joining the herd mentality, or you have these speculative. That's, that's what a retail investor sees. Retail investor sees, I've got that. I'm with the herd no matter what, which is not, not bad. Or I've got these speculative you know, meme stocks, zero date options, levered ETFs, those types of things where you're, get, you're trending from trading to gambling. And if you're not a professional, you're gambling. So you worry that this ends badly? Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think it's a, the integrity of our marketplace, but it's, it's really a broader issue. We are shrinking the amount of investment opportunities on a relative basis for our retail investors. 80% mm -hmm. of the companies that have over $100 million in revenue are private now. We've gone from 8,500 8, public companies How do you to fix below 3,000. What's causing that? What's creating that problem? The, the, it's, it's driven by many factors. It's a dynamic result of capital available for private, but it's mostly driven by the regulatory hurdles to be a public company. It's an interesting perspective. Um, Jay, thank you. Jay Clayton. Thanks. In the meantime, David mentioned the meme stocks today. GameStop, AMC, both surging again, up triple digits ahead of the open. Jim, you've been all over AMC to well, raise some equity. Yeah, well, and they, we, they do close an at-the-market offer. They have an at-the-market offering. Uh, they had it already planned, which is the smart way to do it. The did one Adam thing Aaron I, sell, uh, have any stock left to sell? No, I, it's the company. No, but did Adam Aaron no, I, have I'm any stock left there. to sell? I'm not going there. Why not? Go. Because I don't know the answer. Okay. You want me to, yeah, he does, okay. and he's all selling too much. Well, no, just no, make no, it up. No. Is it no. one of those stories where it's too good to check out? I'll that, just make it up? That was the right answer. If you don't know Thank the you. answer, I don't want to hear Thank from you. Thank you. But I will tell you, I don't know how long this is going, going to go on, but I know how it ends. Badly. It ends badly. You know, the options activity obviously did pick right. up late last week. Who knows about Roaring Kitty and what... Uh, Keith Gill did there or didn't do. All of it's perfectly legal, but right. Um, but Blue but Horseshoe and Blue, Blue Horseshoe and Portnoy. Yeah, but, but there are, Portnoy, yes. right? But there are people buying the options now. To your point, well, these are, and maybe they will do incredibly well. Maybe, I mean, already today they are. Yesterday the volume well, was enormous as well in these. So of course, that has nothing to do with stocks, which is why Jay Clayton in an excellent interview in Squawk. Second time I've quoted Squawk because I'm a team player, and he, you're just talking about the idea. 
is it investing? Does it matter? So he doesn't think it's right. But the problem is, is that it's, this whole game has been caveat emptor from day one. It's just day one. Like, you, look, if I you mean, want to go game, do GameStop at 4 a.m., GameStop's go. market value is going to double from $9 so billion to $18 billion so today. What? No, Our of course, sh- it's absurd. It's ridiculous. Right. And, yeah. and anything else you want to add there. But it's happening. But they could go if you're GameStop. What I would do if you're GameStop, look, there's a law which says you have to time it when you buy back and when you issue stock. There is. But it's a 34. It's all very amorphous. So if you're GameStop, you could sell a billion dollars worth of stock, and then you could get out of the games, gaming business. Why don't we just play the tape from you three years ago when you were saying the same thing every day? But, but that was at 400 when I ripped out the, ca- the uh, Cather, the great moment that has made it so I can't read my Twitter column. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that oh, well, the, that's when you were we were in. Uh, I was, yeah, back, back surgery. Yeah, that's right. Great. I couldn't I barely walk. walk, but you I still showed walk. up to you still walk. showed I, up to work. You yeah, know, I came. I crawled into the hospital, but I wanted to go to work and do mad. And the guy said, "No, you're not going. You're taking being right to the operating room." I said, "No, but I have. I got a great man show mad. tonight. Gotta I got to do mad." Yeah. He said, um, "No, mad. A lot mad, of things are mad's different. Gone that night. A lot of things are different, Jim. About." Today versus that period, namely the percent of shares that are sold short, yeah, is a fraction I mean, of what it was is, that. This is just people having fun. Yeah, I mean, and it's great. I, see, I don't begrudge them one bit. If you want to have fun, you want to get up at 4 a.m. Robin allows you to trade all the time and buy it at 40 and have it go to 60. I love you. I have no me, problems with that. Mind, what does yeah, it matter? Reminds me of Arkegos too, and Bill Huang is. Well, but it doesn't uh, matter. Is, is, it, is, he's uh, on, on well, trial. If Gens, true. But if Gensler were to say, look, I don't like this, then it'd be one thing. But I don't, have anyone heard from Gensler? I mean, Gensler, I mean, he's like the law. He's working on okay. the fireplace. He's so I there. say, it's cleaning it out. I say, ready. you know what? God love it. And I, I tell you, I think Portnoy, would, Portnoy told you he was doing it. You could have done it right alongside Portnoy. Portnoy shows up in everything. It's like, well, there's I mean, nothing you going wanted, on that he doesn't look, want to be a okay, part of. Okay, so Buffett wasn't involved, but Portnoy was. In this particular case, Portnoy is the man to see. It's, it's, it's stunning. That's all I'll say. It's stunning. So GameStop's what? market value is going to more than double. So what? What do you? And have we're going to sit here and talk about the fundamentals. Like people a bunch hated of old, me when I said Nvidia. Should like double. a bunch of old fuddy duddies. People hated what, me when I, I was investigating here when I said that Google at eighty eight was probably worth one fifth of what it was going for. And they, uh, turn, the the uh, general counsel you investigated me wanted to know why, what I knew. They said that I, that it's undervalued. <laughs> That's when Google went public. Yeah, I rested my case there. The process, the defense rested. Hey, how's the defense doing over there downtown? I wouldn't know. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's a lot of I don't knows this morning. I like yeah, that. I'm loving his um, whole rap. <laughs> notice he, notice he didn't distinguish between AMC Entertainment and, and AMC. Over to the trade on these names. Talk more about that with Chris Murphy. He is co-head of derivative strategy at Susquehanna. And Chris, maybe you can give us a little bit of a window into kind of what uh, direction I was going with Boris there. But is this largely a retail driven um, movement as it was in the past and as we perceive it? Or is it hedge funds more involved this time around? Hey, Kelly, thanks. Um, No, it's it's clearly a mix just based on the size of some of the blocks that we're seeing trading in some of these names. You know, when we're seeing... um, you know, five options at a time, one option at a time. We think that's more likely retail when we're seeing um, 2,500, 5,000 block of calls trading at the same time. Um, we're pretty confident that it's a combination. Yeah, and, and what do you, would you say is similar and different this time around from maybe the episodes we've seen in the past couple of years? You know, I, I don't think it's nearly like what we saw in, in 2021. And I think part of the reason why is a lot of the um, short side of these trades, uh, they still remember 2021. Um, you know, they, they learned their lesson. They have some um, some things in place. They're not quite as aggressively short as you remember some of those hedge funds that were the first time around. Um, so, you know, I think this is it's certainly interesting on a day when the S&P is not moving at all. And you think if you weren't looking at this sector, it'd be one of the most boring days of the year as we wait for CPI. So there's some interesting things going on. I don't think it's going to be as big as 2021. Boris hinted that maybe the fundamentals are the reason why these stocks are taking off, that people get wind of job postings and um, employee sentiment turning more positive and think that there's a business and, and ultimately a stock case to be made for that. But your data and some of the others seem to to point more towards this kind of short squeeze. You know, GME, 24 uh, percent short interest, uh, AMC, 21 percent. You know, numbers, some of them are lower, but some of them are also still pretty high. So how would you kind of rack the relative importance of a good fundamental story, even if it's one being whispered about, um, you know, high short interest, which seems to be the most important lever being pulled here? It's a short term, short squeeze 
type of a trade uh, for the most part. Um, it's certainly great if a customer, if a uh, uh, company has great fundamentals and they can point towards that. But you know, these trades are happening intraday, uh, so they're they're not long term investments. It's you know, and as as this trade starting to move from GameStop and AMC into other names, you know, the the momentum chasers who are doing this trade are looking at what's the next highly shorted name that um, that we can look towards. So right. that's all really short term. I mean, the, the names that this is happening to that have strong fundamentals, there are good trades to be made in the options, but it's not um, buying short term calls. OK, so finally, you do think you can identify some of the next candidates maybe for where this wave could be headed. What, what, what examples would you give? I mean, we're just going to follow spikes in call volume, spikes in um, volatility. Um, <laughs> You know, fuel cell, Tupperware, um, SPCE. Uh, saw a pretty interesting call buyer in Roku. Uh, that's more of a mainstream name, but 5,095 calls were bought today. Uh, that has a decent short interest there as well. So, um, you know, we're looking for upticks in volume and, and uh, volatility like everybody else, but just as importantly, looking for down ticks in volatility as a sign that, okay, the momentum chasing trade is leaving these stocks because we're seeing volatility, implied volatility levels start to move lower, you know, where is it going to go next? So there's two parts to that. He traded GameStop during the first meme craze, but welcome, Michael. You have a different strategy this time around. What is it? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think the strategy will be a little different this go around. I think there is some different headwinds we're going to have for these particular meme names. Basically, the, the crux of it is that the original short squeeze, especially with GameStop, happened with this anomaly where there was more shares borrowed than initially existed in the market. So you were short about 125% of the entire float. Hmm. This time you're only short 20% of the float. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing this fade from all-time highs. However, as you noted yourself on the intro, a lot of other short names are starting to move as well. I don't know if this is short companies or, or short funds getting nervous that this might be meme stock 2.0 and covering. But I'm zooming out and looking elsewhere to see if there are other names, especially short float names, that may actually get an advantage based off this move that we're seeing in GameStop. How do you short more shares than there are? There was a lot of speculation to why. I think um, the one thing that everyone agrees on is the reporting for shorts is a little bit archaic. You know, it's we're in 2024 and currently it's every two weeks the actual data is compiled and put on a ledger somewhere. I think the speculation was that, you know, somebody shorts some share in one broker and then the lag happens that, you know, that gets borrowed to another broker and because the data is not being reported instantly and we have this T plus three or T plus zero or T plus one delay, depending on what you're trading, that lag is allowing people to short more than exists. So, um, you know, if we're going to correct that and I, I haven't seen much movement in that fact, I think we need to get to not only shorter settlement, but we need to also get to a point where shorts are reported almost in real time. I thought there was maybe some effort to to do that um, it is urgent now as, as it ever was. And you think the technology certainly exists. So, Michael, what, what yes. should traders do this time around? Maybe people got burned the first time around uh, holding shares that are now they thought more like worthless and maybe they get a second chance. Um, just talk to us about some different strategies here. Yeah, absolutely. I think you need an exit plan. I think if you're in if you're in from the original squeeze or you're getting involved in this squeeze, you know, we we wish you all the best, but there's a large <laughs> chance that, you know, things aren't going to they may happen faster than this time, which is some sort of revision to the mean. So I just implore people to have some type of a plan to say, I am going to get out of my position when X occurs, whatever you decide that is. I think that's something that you need to focus on, because there was a lot of people who didn't have an exit plan last time. And some of the stocks are coming back right now. A lot of them did not. You know, I'm thinking Bed Bath & Beyond, for example, was part of this first meme stock mania. So have an exit plan. Understand that, you know, chasing these moves probably isn't the best idea, either buying these stocks when they're up 130 
40%. What we're doing a lot at Trade Ideas is looking at the entire market of heavily short float names and saying, is there anything that hasn't moved yet? Because if you remember the first meme stock mania and the first short squeeze, there was GameStop that moved initially and then AMC moved after that. And then we had BlackBerry. What happened is traders jumped from heavily shorted name to heavily shorted name to heavily shorted name. So if we are going to see that same thing repeat and the same continuation again, what we're really trying to focus on is what could potentially be the next one that they jump to. And then also what companies look OK and are maybe doing a little bit better financially or doing a little bit better when it comes to market trends than a GameStop or an AMC that could take advantage in the long run of these short squeezes if they happen. If the federal government is giving money away, I think you should take it. Say Uncle Sam decided to give a lot of money away, yet very few people took advantage of the opportunity. Well, you couldn't tell from the averages, Dow gaining 127 points, S&P advancing 0.48%, NASDAQ climbing 0.75% to a new all-time record! But today the market was consumed by smaller investors buying shares in lousy meme stocks like GameStop and AMC. They're betting that, like in January 2021, the short sellers won't be able to take the pain. The house of pain. And when that happens, the shorts need to go buy in stock. Buy, 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 Creating what's known as a short squeeze to propel stocks to ever dizzying heights, even much higher than we saw today. Now, we don't know when that ends, but it does end eventually, and it doesn't end well. It sure hit the last time we did this in 2021, leaving many people holding a deflated bag. And more on that later. For now, though, I want to talk about the big opportunity nobody seemed to care about. Washington's giving money away. Where? In a fact sheet that hit my desk from the White House titled, quote, President Biden takes action to protect American workers and businesses from China's unfair trading practices. Wow, here it comes. The gist. The president believes that the Chinese are, I'm going to quote again, flooding global markets with artificially low price exports, end quote. So Biden's using his power to slap tariffs on an $18 billion in exports from China. That's meaningful. Normally, once that kind of news gets published, any stock that could conceivably benefit would soar. But you see, today's inve- today investors were so drawn to illusory short-busting opportunities that they overlook these very real tariff opportunities. And yes, now that we go from that to this, meme stocks, here's where things stand. A game stock sitting at 53.99, it's up about 10% right now this morning. AMC up about 10%. SunPower Corporation has dropped about 10%, so watch that volatility. And our good friends at BlackBerry are up a little over 1.5% after what was a wild, wild ride yesterday. We'll talk more about that, the implications of it. Are we back? Are we back? It's like going in a time machine, the whole situation. So GameStop's up, Sorkin, today. It is, but but, but it not as a, much as what it was. It, was. Six, it opened yes. at six, almost 65 it yesterday. Did. And it closed at 48. It did. So being up today, it gets it into the mid-50s. We still aren't hitting that crazy high that, that we hit yesterday. I'm, I'm torn. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's like certifiably insane but then I, I, there are people that write in so you clowns think it's okay for the hedge funds to have naked shorts and do this and do that but it's not okay when uh, the individual investor decides to get involved and and cause a short squeeze to these hedgies that are screwing us this all the time this isn't even a short squeeze that and they're gonna they're squeezing themselves that's what we <laughs> keep saying but we did there were huge losses in in people that were short these stocks yesterday almost a almost a billion dollars so it was very very hard to borrow this stock though right well, which means it's very hard when to... you can do it naked well <laughs> My only- I'm playing into all the, right? I'm, I'm playing into all the... The, the whole drugs. idea that the little guy is somehow screwing the big guy. No, the big guy's screwing the little guy. Oh, and now they're getting back. And somehow, but it's uh, but the, the the sad part is, the truth is, the big guy is still screwing the little guy, and the little guy just doesn't even know it. That's the problem. Okay. Well, I, I just... Actually, I'm throwing you some red meat. I don't even want to be involved, uh, to be honest with you. Things are quiet. Right now, and yeah, in, your Reddit in, account in, is doing okay. I don't know about Reddit. I would never look at that. <laughs> I, I just would. But my my Twitter, uh, my X thing is your okay account is for now. For now. For now. Okay, you, you keep watching that. How about yours? We'll see. I, I, I <laughs> what is it? A- Andrew up. R. Sorkin. I, know I got some. Yeah, Andrew R. Sorkin. Bring it. Bring it on. Bring it. Bring it on. 
More volatility for the meme stocks ahead of the open today. Shares of GameStop and AMC both down in the pre-market. Uh, still up triple digits for the week so far. Jim, you were just talking about the battle between the buyers and sellers. Right. Well, there's really a question about whether anyone is shorting the stock to the buyers. So last, last night around 4 o'clock, the buyers came in and they just blitzed it higher. Uh, and it just seemed like they were taking, taking, taking. There were no sellers. Maybe there's some sellers like uh, who have a good till cancel order to sell. But then sellers just flooded into the market at 4.30 a.m. They were like heat-seeking missiles just blowing through all the bids. So you saw 52, 51, 50, right down to 40. And then they uh, they tried to recover. It took it back to 53 around 8 o'clock, and now they're back. There are real sellers. Uh, and that's what did, they didn't have yesterday. So they have to wait till options start, and then you have to have a, you have to short the options to to, cut, to be able to make the trade if you're a market maker, and they'll try to blitz them. Uh, but right now the stock's very heavy because the valuation of it, uh, it, no one can figure out how you can possibly get to the 40s. I mean, I did a compare last night to Best Buy because they had the same market capitalization, and one has five billion in revenues, one has 43 billion in revenues, one is making 16 million, the other one's making uh, uh, more than a billion. It's very hard to read because I mean, they're both gaming. You buy gaming at both those places. So the people who are doing the memes, if they actually want to do a comp, a compare, compare right now to Best Buy, and you'll understand why you're paying too much. Are you, are you saying the craze, to the degree it's been a mania of sorts, is peaked? Well, I think that the company's a little wiser. I think that there is no investment case, and there's not a lot of shorts. They need more shorts. They need more short sellers that they can bust. And right now, they haven't succeeded in making these people cover. Only 24% of it is short. David, that's not enough of GameStop. That's not enough to generate a true short squeeze, typically. It's not, really? A quarter of the of the outstandings being short? No, but they had 100% it used to be 100 before. plus, right? Yeah, yeah it, was, uh, it was obviously when the meme stock craze began years ago. It was a much higher percentage. Right. That's true. Now, I will say... Although they've suffered some serious pain. Yeah, you know, but the, they did have a profitable... They did have uh, the last 12 months, they were profitable 23, but uh, I don't think they're making a lot of money now. I mean, this is a very bad time to be in that particular business, okay? Bad time to be in the gaming business. Yes, it would seem to be. I mean, I'm, you know, even, my, if, even if you're delivering it digitally, if they somehow are, in, uh, you know, that yeah, transition. Yeah, well, that's free, you know. Brick and mortar, yeah. Brick and mortar. Have help. they come up with a new strategy under Ryan Cohen that you're aware of? Because I haven't followed it. It's a mystery. I suggested many different strategies. Oh, well, I'm aware you did. And, and I always. You also am, have some land in New Mexico if they're interested in that. Have, I have 600,000 acres in option. Maybe a gaming, a gaming well, uh, uh, theme park. I think that anybody who's in the gaming business would be wise to think about that 600,000 option. If you could build. Whoa! When Walt came to, to Florida, yes, there was yes, nothing there. Yes, yes. There's nothing swamp. in New Mexico. It was nothing. Swamp land. My place nothing. is midway between Denver, which is a city of, of success, well, yeah, success yes. come, obviously, and Austin. That's a used to be a city of success. It sounds like data centers to me. Just go for it, data centers. Don't forget water. Put up a power plant. Okay. Yeah. This is TBA. I come right. to TBA. We'll work on it. Welcome back to Squawk Box. GameStop and AMC seeing increased buying from small investors, though much less than the meme stock surge three years ago. Join us right now is uh, Eric So. He's a professor of global economics and management at MIT. You know, I keep shaking my head at this, saying we're, we're living in some kind of time machine. You know, there are folks online who are very unhappy with that perspective. What's yours? Great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I think the headline for the today has to be that the meme stops are com coming roaring back thanks to Roaring Kitty. You know, I teach my students at MIT that stock prices, of course, move due to business fundamentals, but they also move due to waves of, of market sentiment, which really reflect periods of heightened demand that have little to do with fundamentals. And so when these sentiment waves begin to form, savvy investors jump in early in anticipation of the wave building further. But that initial buying pressure tends to create more upward price pressure, which then kind of feeds into FOMO for other investors who then jump in. And the cycle can continue. In some extreme cases, uh, as we saw in 2021, this can lead to sustained bubbles in asset prices. What's really needed, though, is a clear signal that a sentiment wave is, in fact, forming. And that's where Roaring Kitty jumped in. So each retail investor is likely too small to meaningfully move markets on their own, but they can create meaningful movements in price when they band together. Okay, Eric, I hear all of that. I just want to understand whether you think this is, this is some kind of manipulation. Is there something that should be done about it? 
I, the reason I say that is, and I know people are probably saying, there are people out there trading this, they're saying, you know, Sorkin, stop it. Don't, you know, it's not your job to protect us. Uh, and in fact, you're not protecting us. You're protecting, you're protecting the man, whoever you think the man is. But the truth is that a lot of people last time around who saw this movie, we, we know the movie, we know how it ends in advance. It's like, you know, you know, you know how it ends. And yet it happens anyway. And so the question is, what, what are folks supposed to do about it? Because most people who are watching us right now who are involved in this are going to lose money. Yeah, so I think you could think about potential regulation either from like an ethical or a practical perspective. I think from a practical perspective, it's going to be very hard to, to rein in some of this retail trading in a meaningful way. If you look at what Roar and Kitty uh, and others have posted in recent days, it hardly you know, reaches the, the threshold of what I would consider stock manipulation. But also just from an ethical uh, standpoint, I mean, I, look, I think that uh, I understand the desire for orderly and fair financial markets. I think, though, it comes with some costs associated with potential regulation, including disenfranchising retail investors who you know, I think are underrepresented in financial markets. So I understand the desire for regulation, but implementing it and whether it creates externalities, I think, poses some significant hurdles. So you think that if you, you, you think that the retail investor is not disenfranchised? I would argue, unfortunately, the retail investor has always been disenfranchised. In fact, I think one of the things that we try to do here on this network and uh, anybody who's involved in covering the world of finance at all is trying to democratize this in some way. But the truth is that the man that, you know, a hedge fund that has a, you know, several hundred million dollar a year, in some cases, budget, uh, you know, to buy satellite data and, and information and research that others can't get access to, which is completely illegal, um, you know, make it very, very difficult from a trading perspective, daily trading, not necessarily as a long term investor, but on daily trading like this, it makes it, it, it makes the playing field not always feel level. That, that's right. Uh, I, I, I definitely understand that sentiment. I think, though, putting in further regulations, putting in uh, you know restrictions on retail trading is only likely to amplify that. Uh, for example, if the SEC were to really take action against or Kitty or retail traders on Reddit, I think you. I don't see- know what the I don't know what the action would be. That's the hard, that's what would be the what would be the action? Yeah, I, I think he posts uh, a picture of some guy leaning leaning exactly. forward in a chair. I don't even know what the case looks like. What would you even write? What would you tell the judge? That's exactly right. So uh, yesterday uh, I saw you had, you know, former uh, the SEC commissioner on talking about hauling him in front of, on, on CNBC. I think just uh, that illustrates some of the practical limitations of any potential regulation. About the return to the meme stock trade this week, and it seems to have meant a lot of business for trading platforms, um, including Robinhood. Joining us right now is Robinhood's chief brokerage officer, Steve a quirk. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, we're all trying to understand what you think actually happened this week, why this happened, and really how much of this was driven by retail versus institutions. Yeah, if, if we just look at the numbers, um, the last time the meme stocks, you know, had their rally, um, we're probably doing about our in our customer base, we're probably doing about a quarter of the volume. Okay. That we were at that point in time. So we're not seeing which tells you what? Well, it tells me, well, there's a couple things that it tells me. Number one, if you think about all the people that came into the market during that period, I mean, a huge, huge number of new market participants right. entered that at that point in time. Um, they've grown up. We can see that in, in our data. 80% of those customers are still with us, mm-hmm. but now they're opening retirement accounts. They're looking for yield you know, they're they're opening the credit card to get three percent. They're move. They're, they've moved on with their life, and they're sort of rounding out their investing experience. Um, in this instance, we did see our volume spike. So there is still is interest in this. You know, there's interest in movement and volatility. That's really what it is. But you know, our two biggest days were not anything related to this, they were around NVIDIA, NVIDIA right. earnings and do NVIDIA you, news. Do you Ooh. look at this as a positive thing I or do. a negative thing for the marketplace? When I, you see stocks move like this, I mean, we were talking about sort of the integrity of the market yeah. uh, the other day with Jay Clayton, former head of the SEC. I watch and I think there is genuine concern that when yeah. things like this happen and it's not really moving for fundamental reasons, that it undermines that integrity. 
Yeah, I think that, by the way, there's a good segment and I watched it um, here. He made a couple points, which I thought were really interesting. The number of tradable instruments is down pretty <laughs> dramatically, right? At the same time, we're at the highest participation rate in the U.S. for households. So now you have more participants with fewer instruments, right? That's naturally going to lead to some concentration in areas. I would also say even the number of people that came into the marketplace, you know, during COVID and, right. and the GameStop era, those people are still in the marketplace. The majority of them are still in the marketplace, and now they're investing right. in a very different way. So I, the question always becomes, hey, we would all like, we all think it's beneficial for, for every American to, to participate in the greatest right. wealth creation vehicle in the world. Um, how they get there, if it's through this, Right, but if it's through speculation and they lose, yes, that's a problem. It is it a big Sometimes problem. they yes. leave. Mm-hmm. They don't stay. Yeah. So when you see a GameStop move the way it does or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Trump, uh, Trump Media's yeah, company, yeah, yep. that's a top 10, top yeah, 10 it's stock. One of the top 10. I think it's on, number 10. Yes. Number 10 on your uh, mm-hmm. on Robinhood. I don't know what you think of that. Do you say to yourself that th- this seems like a completely plausible Here, valuation or do you say... This is insane. Yeah. And the, the folks, you know, it's hard to tell your clients that they're not smart, but are they making a big, big mistake? Here's the way I'd say it. If you think like we can watch what they're doing with their portfolios. And, I, and as I said, 80 percent of those people that came in the marketplace are still with us. Over two thirds of the people that are even uh, participating in GameStop, AMC, DJT, they're long term investors. So they're taking a small portion of their portfolio and saying, this is interesting. It's what everybody's talking about. And they think of it as a trade. They think of it as a trade. It's not an investment. It's not something that they they, they might, because you can look at, you you looked at our RICs. You can see AMC and GameStop are not moving to the top of that. This is a trade for them and something interesting. But their core portfolio is going to remain, you know, the most popular names that, that sit on that. No, when you said that they're acting differently this time, it's like, yeah, they got about a tenth of the money they had last time that they were, if they stayed in some of those names, right? I mean, it, it, yeah, I don't, I think, but you have to make the assumption that's the only thing they were doing. Right, they were doing other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. But, but and, it's been, there's been a lot of, a lot of pain in those, in the meme stocks. Still, there this has week. been, yeah. yeah. Um, Meantime, uh, meme stocks, we continue to watch. uh, Oh, what is that? Ahead of the open, a day after both GameStop and AMC dropped around 20%. We've been getting these halts, Jim, for volatility now on the downside. I felt bad. The people at 4 o'clock, they were selling it down to 33. And I said, ah, they didn't get the collapsible chair memo. Remember the other day that started with the Hello Kitty with the chairs? And I find that what's happened is, is that this was, they just didn't have the short positions. And then Adam Aaron came in and used them to be able to pay down debt because Adam's hysterical. You know, he said, what, he's a legendary uh, cinema funny man. <laughs> so you think there was a plan in a drawer for a return of this moment? And as soon as it came, they're like, let's go. Well, yeah, Adam, Adam definitely. I think that, uh, that Ryan Cohen is a great mystery man. He's uh, he, he's inscrutable, Ryan. We don't really know what he's up to. We know he made a lot of money in Bed Bath & Beyond. I always salute a guy who made a lot of money, e- even as I think that I would ne- not necessarily have approached it that way. It sounds, though, like you think this this whole phenomenon may be short-lived this time because well, just, of the short. I think it, look, it would help if the company were doing well. The company's not losing the money that it was, but we have a cycle, and you'll hear it from Take Two uh, later. You know, th- th- This is not a great business. Because everyone did it online, and the, they picked the company. There's so many companies they could have picked that they could have run and gunned. And this one just ha- isn't as good as when they first ran it and, and gunned it. Uh, you can go back, by the way, if you look at this uh, kitty guy. Uh, he's still got the rationale for why he first gunned it. And there it was pretty compelling, but that was then and this is now. And yet your criticism of regulators, uh, the 24-7 casino, well, they don't care, the regulators. They, I think they view everything as caveat enter. Uh, I think that they kind of really blew the Bitcoin thing when they had a chance. They could have gone after the coins that were less legit uh, and become a world leader uh, the way uh, Tim Massett, who ran the CFTC, 
recommended, and they, they kind of split the CFTC and the SEC. And I, it's not really clear where the SEC or they let the SPAC phenomena go. I know that their heart's in the right place. I know that they have a lot of good thoughts. But I thought that Jay Clayton on Squawk was unbelievable. He said, look, this, there's no place for this. But I think that the SEC maybe feel like the 34 Act says nothing about memeing, so therefore meme away. Well, do you think, I mean, you say, you, you've often said the FTC is heavy-handed. Do you think the SEC is too light-handed? I think the SEC is, is too caveat emptor. Uh, I do think um, I have felt that, here's something, Chubb has an auto insurance business, and Geico I mean, is an I mean, auto insurance business. mentioned this this morning online. I wonder whether, I mean, if the FTC wanted to kind of just show, listen, we have guts, maybe they look into that? Meme stocks like AMC and GameStop losing some steam today, but still seeing huge gains this week. Let's get some insight now on what the retail investors thinking about the meme trades and the bigger Dow run to 40K. Retail trader and online personality Ryan Minoski, known as Stockmo, joins us now. His YouTube channel, also called Stockmo, has well over 600,000 subscribers. Uh, it's great to have you here, Ryan. Welcome. I appreciate being on here. Thank you. It's interesting that we're seeing both the broad market and the meme stocks really perking up this week. What do you think is going on here? Well, you know, I asked the community yesterday, I said, why are we moving into some of these plays? And for example, today, I see Faraday Future Intelligent Electric absolutely exploding up. And it's the short squeeze. Some people want to go ahead and get the bears. They want to get, attack the shorts. And you're seeing that play up 3,100% in what, three days? You got GameStop, of course, Roaring Kitty. He came out and post after what three years? Mm -hmm. Three years. He doesn't say a word. We get a little bit of a, a, a little guy leaning up. I'm paying attention. Right. And now we're getting a lot of video clips through there, and of course, we know that he has a huge, just a huge community sure. uh, from back in 2021. The one, and so that's driving a lot of interest in these meme plays right now. Yeah, and I think what I find so striking about it is it'd be one thing if he did a, a one-off post or, or Ryan Cohen or any of these guys. But it's it's got to be more than a coincidence that this happens at the same time that the broader market is making new highs. And if I think back to the last time around when AMC and GameStop were jumping, it was January of 2021. The market, again, was in a period where it was about to go off and kind of have a blow off top later that year. So there just seems to be plenty of money sloshing around, for lack of a better word, right? It's not as if this consumer is feeling so strapped that they're thinking to themselves, I better get my money out of the market instead of pouring it in. No, I, I agree with that. People are seeing opportunities out there. And I think one of the big thing that Wall Street doesn't understand about the retail community is that if they just wanted that 10 percent annually, they would go into the S&P 500. They are looking for bigger gains. They are also looking for reason to invest, to be a part of something bigger than the individual. So when you see these meme plays and people talk about the communities are huge. It's a different time now than it was, say, 20 years ago. Online presence allows people to be part of something like this. And so I, a lot of people, they, they do it for the community. Other people were just point. They just came right out and said, I'm looking to make as much money as I can. I want a little piece of the pie. Others want to put it to the shorts. They want to go out there. And thus, like I said today, uh, Faraday Future Intelligent, you know, I saw that two days ago pop up on a lot of the comments in my Discord, on my channel. And they, and two days later, it's up 3,100%. Hmm. And now we know how this plays out in the long run, but that is one of the main catalysts that you're seeing from a lot of retail investors. They want to get a lot. They want to get in. They want to take advantage of it, put it to the, the bears and walk out, hopefully holding a lot of cash. Let me ask you a kind of broad question, if I might, uh, Ryan. And, and, and that is this, you know, here on CNBC, we have a lot of people who mention stock names, who are traders, who are in and out just as maybe you are or uh, Hyper Kitty. What is his name? Uh, Roaring Kitty. Roaring Kitty. <laughs> Roaring Kitty. <laughs> Excuse me. Hyper Kitty. Hyper that's Kitty. my. going to be my name. Uh, that's a that's a channel right there. Hey, a, I got start it. that up. I'm going home right now. I'm, I'm leaving here. I'm leaving, folks. I'm out of here. But, but oh my, my question is, OK, so so here you have people on CNBC doing essential mentioning names, doing things like this. Uh, and then you have a whole community, communities, large ones built around folks like yourself, uh, like Roaring mm -hmm. Kitty and others who have followings in the hundreds of thousands who are trying to 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 learn and how to be an investor. How should people think about 
this world and these individuals, yourself included, as yeah. guides to investing, guardians of capital? Well, I, I can answer that pretty straightforward. You can't trust everyone out there. I, myself, for those who don't know, I, I've been an educator, high school, college level. I also been a formal financial advisor, two master's degrees, lots of accolades, two national championships with my kids. We coach 15 state championships. It's who you follow. You got to make sure you look at the background. Are they, are they, and can you trust them? Let's be blunt. Uh, and of course, out there, there is a lot of different communities. And Roaring Kitty, you know, Hyper Kitty, whatever Hyper Kitty. you want to go with. Yeah. At the end of the day, you got to have faith that the retail investors are going to do their due diligence and who they follow, what stocks they get into. My platform is all about financial literacy. And I've been pushing that since I was an educator into my yeah. own channel. And, of course, making as much money as we can along that way. Quick question. Do you think this is the same crowd who was involved in the meme stock run up the first time around three years ago? Or is it a fresh one? Yeah. It's a combination. I, I had some people come out and they say, who's Roaring Kitty? Hmm. And then a lot of them said, I've been here since 2021. I'm still holding. And so you get a nice combination of both. Some people said I was a part of that. And, you know, I got burnt and now I'm just going to watch from the sidelines. But as you guys talked about earlier, a lot of FOMO out there, a lot of people wanting to get in in multiple plays throughout the day. You can see them running up hundreds of percent. And at the end of the day, there it, it gets the community fired up. And I can see it in my channel right now if you go in there and look. The week started with meme mania uh, resurging after a tweet from Roaring Kitty for the first time in three years. Uh, but the rally in GameStop and AMC shares both started to fade by midweek. Stocks are still up sharply, though, over the last several days. Joining us now with more, J.J. Kinahan, uh, CEO of IG North America. J.J., you're, you're, not the hey, first person, you're not the first person to come in here and say that as far as retail, it really it was kind of a non-event, even though it happened again. But it, it didn't really spread very much, and especially beyond GameStop. No, it was... Uh Pretty much 36 hours of excitement, if you will, Joe. But quite honestly, you know, it started on Monday. Uh, our clients on Monday really didn't participate as much. On Tuesday, they participated more. What was interesting is it was GameStop, and it was also a, a bit of AMC. And quite honestly, our clients participated more in AMC than they did in GameStop. And I think that's purely a function of price. The fact of the matter is, you know, AMC was a cheaper stock, cheaper options, and Let's face it, people who have participated, this, in, I'm going to guess most every case, was not part of their normal game plan. It was a, mo a momentum stock, and people were, you know, the uh, part of their portfolio that they're willing to take a little bit more risk on. They went in and, and, and did that. So overall, this was not one that spread like, you know, wildfire, which we saw back a few years ago. You saw more excitement with the CPI probably on Wednesday. Was the volume... Uh, really strong on Wednesday, and then it. What it, Thursday? You said it was very. The volume dried up immediately. What does that say? Even though we went over forty thousand, which is, I mean, the S and P is the, the main index, but yeah, I mean, the Dow is a wonderful index, and back when it was invented, obviously made a lot of sense. But for you know, it's thirty stocks, price weight, it doesn't make a lot of sense. S and P is the one that people actually care about. The Dow overall is not one that, uh, yeah, forty thousand, great. Well, you know, maybe psychologically, some people thought it was a big deal. But overall, let's face it, no professional uh, wakes up and says, all right, here's what the Dow is doing. If, if the way for, uh, you know, your viewers to think about it in terms of those who are retail, again, look at the indices that the mutual fund managers, et cetera, are being compared to. It's always the S&P 500. So that's the one that you should be watching overall. That's the one that actually matters. And uh, because of the way it is weighted in terms of uh, a volume and, uh, I'm sorry, a float and price of the stocks rather than just pure price of the stocks. Then what about Thursday, th uh, yesterday, uh, in terms of volume what, uh, compared yesterday to Wednesday? Was, Go on. Yeah, no, yesterday was actually okay. Uh, you know, it's been a strange week in that we haven't seen the cr crazy volumes yet. You could say, I mean, AMC and GameStop did add some volume. There's no question about that. 
But at the end of the day, that's not sustainable volume overall. So I think that what you're seeing, you know, today we have an expiration. So I would expect to see a little bit more volume overall, uh, particularly in the first half hour and in the last half hour. But, I, I, you know, it's been a strange week in terms of it almost feels like people are already sort of winding down a little bit, if you will, for Memorial Day. I think next week may help a little bit in terms of we start to get some of the retail earnings. I think those are going to be some of the most interesting earnings overall. You have things like Target and Macy's. And so uh, we really want to see what they're going to say going forward in terms of their outlook, because it's been a little bit uh, of a strange story from the retailers so far. And, you know, we'll just I really thought the comments by Walmart yesterday in terms of people searching for value, which is often, as you know, people trading down a little bit in terms of maybe what they're going for. So I think we're finally starting to see the real first effects uh, in many ways on the consumer in terms of what's going on for some of the inflationary pressures, et cetera. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if Target Macy's are seeing that same kind of thing overall and if they talk about the value type customers. So for me, next week is something that gives us a real uh, insight into going forward. And again, if you look at the rate cut expectations, a lot of people only have one on the table right now, with September being at about 68 percent probability of a rate cut. As for GME, uh, we got the mixed shelf file. Wow. We got the preliminary number below consensus. Going to open below 22, Jim. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to offer stock. Uh, they do it at the money, so they're not going to club the stock. I wish he'd done it the day before, but I think they had to put out the, the horrible yes. preliminary results before they do this. And when I, I, the thing, you know, there's there's a lot of things wrong with GameStop that we never talk about. We talk about the, the kitty litter, whatever it is, the <laughs> fresh step that this guy's making with $30 this morning. He's clearly an ill-advised jet. I, I didn't call him a joker. I don't do that stuff anymore. But there is a real problem. It's an existential problem. For instance, you you know, the, um, the NCA, the new games coming out, it was delayed, you know, because of the NILs. And I follow this stuff pretty closely because everybody in the office is looking for it. Now, if you, you, you pre-order it. If you download it, it comes immediately. All right? If you go to, to GameStop, it's one to three days. So, and it's same price. So what is the advantage of GameStop? Well, you might want the disc because you might want to go to a friend's place, have a sleepover. He doesn't have it. Sure. So maybe it's okay to have a three-day wait. Otherwise, why not just download it for the same price? Right. And that's the existential crisis. That's why what's great about GameStop is they could close it. They could close? They could close it. And then we wouldn't have to mess with it anymore because it's irrelevant, Carl. It so, is irrelevant. So whatever, you, and I looked at I matched it against Best Buy. And every single price, Assassin's Creed. There's 72 different Assassin's Creed. They're all the same price. But if I go to Best Buy, I can also get the refreshed PC right. with the AI assistant. So is this all about extending and pretending then? Whatever hay they're able to make? That's good. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying well, I'm look, I mean, say. Brian Cohen, maybe he's using the uh, Bed Bath & Beyond model. I miss my Bed Bath & Beyond model. It's a pickleball court. Wait a second. That's a better use for it. I just think the GameStop, I mean, I, I remember when I went to the Livingston Mall, which was that in itself an experience. And there was a GameStop on the first level and a GameStop on the second level. And I was thinking, are you kidding me? Um, so I think that it's fighting for relevance. I think it became the stock. It made sense to short it, other than the fact that they overly shorted it. But it's an existential crisis. It's been one since I had Paul Rains on, where he was trying to make it into a, the late Paul Rains was fabulous, uh, make it into a swag store. Carl, look at the prices. They're no different from Best Buy. Look at the time that it takes. There's no better to have it if you have Xbox and just download it. And everyone who's playing with it, I urge them to go to one. I urge them to use it. And I think they would say, you know what, we ought to switch and we should do it with um, Foot Locker. <laughs> Let's go on Foot Locker. You know, I mean, they need to go to another one. Let's pick another retailer that that is struggling for relevance, but at least has a CEO that understands the business. Yeah. I mean, it, really, I can go to the mall and I can find 20 other stores that are better. Most of which are covered today by Matt Boss's piece. Yep. Yep. And I mean, at least, you know, Kohl's bought support. They, they got the right to have support. Yeah, they yes. buy it. And that changes. GameStop has to take in. They have to do something so different. So, I, I don't know. Like, maybe with Petco. You're not joking. You something oh, no. outside the box. Oh, no. There's nothing there. Yeah. There's nothing again. Hey, you know, let's have Strauss Selnick on. You ask him about why GameStop it's exists. It's not a bad idea. And I think it's going to be a head scratch. Yeah. We'll talk to him at 11, as yeah. we said. They could offer, I don't know, um, like Bucky's has great sandwiches in Texas. 
Merge it with GameStop. <laughs> when we uh, if I were them, I would do one of the, I would do a GameStop like stock offering and just get that balance sheet and what, I know, that's awful, but geez, you know, GameStop's got that, they've got a Assassin's Creed, they got the Creed, they got the Netflix and the, you know, I mean, they got, no, they got, what's they got, they got the game, they, 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 what is that they have all the things on? Twitch! Oh, Twitch, They yes. got the game, Assassin's Creed Twitch! You, which need, I'm a, you need a Twitch just, show. You need a show I, on I Twitch. I am told that that Twitch version, which you can get on Best Buy, same well, price, but in Amazon, you can get the Twitch version. We'll you get cheap. you a big, fat mic, and you can do a Twitch for as long yeah. as you want. Listen, There's Twitch, no going to break. Really, um, but, uh, yeah, I, look, Red Red Redemption, I understand. My nephew, us, head writer and soul writer, when, when I, I get this, when I'm late with my copy, he, he's playing uh, the, the Red Dead Redemption. Yes, yes. So, you know, Uncle Jumbo, wait, you're really I, late with The Journal copy. today says Microsoft's going to put Call of Duty on a subscription service, uh, well, there quoting you go. some sources. There you go. Yeah. Look, that was a brilliant thing. It was fought by the FTC. And I'm not saying anything bad about the FTC anymore, other than that it was fought. It didn't work. This last week refreshed our memories of many things. DFE's memes, the financial press trashing individual investors, regulators turning a blind eye, and doing absolutely nothing about manipulation happening in the financial markets, and people so detached from reality that they start questioning if a random guy on the internet should be allowed to post memes on social media. Early in the week, members of the financial press appeared surprised, and slightly more positive toward the idea of GameStop and AMC rallying, resulting in more individual investors piling into options. Then, as the week continued on, AMC and GameStop dropped lower in price. Both companies raised capital, and of course, the financial press started absolutely trashing individual investors, GME stock, and AMC stock in the latter half of the week. Ultimately, the money managers on Wall Street and their paid actors in the financial press do not want GameStop or AMC to succeed. Why? Because both of these companies and their respective stocks are representative of individual investors making their own financial decisions. Additionally, both AMC and GME have brought to light a lot of the problems in the financial markets over the past few years and highlighted much of the corruption that exists in the financial system. This infuriates the financial media and their overlords on Wall Street. They don't want you to ask questions or have your own opinions on any given topic. Instead, they want you to make financial decisions based on what they tell you to do. They want you to buy the stocks they say to buy, to sell the stocks they say to sell, and to do so when they tell you to. And so, if we had true supply and demand in the financial markets, and not infinite liquidity injected into the markets by market makers doubling as hedge funds. And if GameStop and AMC were to rally substantially and for a sustained period, this would fly in the face of everything that they want you to think. They don't want you to think that you as an individual investor are capable of making financial decisions on your own. No, they want you to be dependent on their opinions as to what you should do with your money. That's really what this is all about, money, power, and corruption. Please leave a like on this video so more people will see it. And while you're down there, please consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.